Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Bill Burns. I'm the product manager, um, and also I've been a technical lead and developer for TotalView for many years. So um, I got a number of things to cover today uh, that we'll go through here. I got some live demos that I'll do as well. But uh, I wanted to start off just ask a few questions. So who's familiar with TotalView here? Has anybody used it before? OK, good. We have a few people. Awesome. Um, second question I want to ask is, so how many of you guys are using Python now? OK, good number. Are you mixing Python with C or C++ at all? Calling down to Python extensions. Good. All right, good. So I'll have a demo that we'll uh, talk about doing some debugging around that today. So, uh, so let, me, let me jump right in on here. And uh, for folks that aren't familiar with TotalView, I'll go through some features here. Uh, so TotalView has been around for about 30 years. Um, it uh, was born um, from the start to be a parallel debugger. Um, we actually go back to uh, when um, uh, some code was being written on a torpedo using a butterfly architecture, and they needed to debug that code. Uh, and that's where TotalView started there, and we've grown through the years uh, as machines and architectures and technologies have advanced. We um, cover C, C++, and Fortran um, for multi-core, multi-threaded debugging. Um, you'll see as I, I go through the talks on here that TotalView allows you to grow, uh, debug from scale all the way up to all the groups uh, and processes in your group, right down to individual, individual thread levels. We uh, also support uh, CUDA, uh, if anybody's doing for uh, GPU development now, and Xeon Phi uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to spend some time and talk about our integrated reverse debugging technology. Uh, it's quite an amazing technology, and I hope you'll be impressed with it today as well. Uh, I'm going to do a demo of mixed language debugging with Python and C and C++, and uh, show you the capabilities that TotalView has there. We have integrated memory debugging, and uh, it is also built around uh, supporting parallel and HPC, just like TotalView is. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit today as well. Uh, there's times that you can't or don't want to do interactive debugging within your cluster, and TotalView has a whole batch uh, debugging capability uh, right in with it that allows you to submit it to the job. TotalView is running behind the scenes, and uh, you can collect information, and if a problem happens there, it'll generate information out to reports, so you can do some post-mortem debugging. We work across a, a large variety of Unix on uh, different architectures. Uh, we also support Mac OS. Uh, and different other Unix flavors, such as AIX and Solaris. Now, one thing that I want to kind of get across is TotalView is a debugger. It's great for finding bugs in the code. But as many of you probably uh, know nowadays, uh, applications are getting just quite large, um, either in complexity due to the number of processes and threads um, or just their size. I have uh, customers that um, are routinely debugging two, three, four gigabyte size applications. Uh, and um, trying to get a hold of that and understand it is hard. So TotalView is, is a great tool for just learning your code. You may have just inherited some library that you're using and don't know how it works. Well, start walking through it, and you'll see, especially with the reverse debugging, some of the capabilities for doing that. All right, so um, in the couple demos today, you're going to see two versions of TotalView's user interface. So in the upper right up there, um, we've traditionally had a Motif interface uh, that's been around for many years. Um, it's worked very well, but it's, it's getting a little dated. And we've been working on a new user interface that's Qt-based, if folks are familiar with Qt at all. Um, it's got more of an IDE-like flavor to it. It's themable. It's um, dockable windows and everything with it. Um, we've been improving our workflows a lot uh, as you are working with TotalView. And um, so you'll kind of see a flavor of both of those today. Um, the new UI will be around for, um, for a while. We're still pulling in some functionality into um, the old UI, into the new UI. Um, so we have some gaps here that uh, we continue to fill. Um, but you'll see in our, in our release that's coming out at the end of this month, we're going to be promoting the new UI a lot more. Um, and if you guys, um, TotalView is installed here at Argon for you guys to play around with. And if you want to try the new UI, you can just simply say TotalView-new UI. Simple as that. Doesn't matter on the case for UI. Um, so. So let's start off with Python debugging. So what we've seen for trends uh, is that Python is beginning to be used a lot in, within the HPC community. Um, it's being learned at schools. It's a great language for bringing something up quickly. Uh, and it has the added benefit that it's very easy to mix C or C++ in with it by building what's called a Python extension. And you load that right into Python, and you use it from your Python code, and it just looks like Python. Um, 
But of course, this creates, uh, and there's different technologies for doing that. If people are used to SWIG, which is kind of a general purpose technology for pulling different um, languages together, the C types and others. Of course, debugging this, you've now added another level of complexity on there. Um, so trying to understand that can be difficult on there. So um, what we've done with TotalView is we've created a very easy um, way to build a Python debugging session. And uh, TotalView understands what's going on inside of that Python interpreter. Um, and of course, when your C++ code is loaded as the extension, TotalView understands that because that's what it's been uh, very good at for many years. And with all this information, we can build a, a nice, cohesive, uh, integrated call stack that goes from language to language. So if you started in Python, ended up in C++, you'll see a nice merging of those call stacks. You can look at variables on both sides on there. Um, sometimes you go in the other way where you're embedding a Python interpreter inside of C++. You can go that way. We've created some very nice call stacks as we've weaved the languages in and out of the, each other. So. Uh, right now, we support Python 2.7. We'll be adding Python 3 very soon. Um, Python 2 um, is going to end of life, I think, in 2020. And uh, more and more um, uh, places are using Python 3 now. So what TotalView is not yet um, is a full up Python debugger. So you can't set your breakpoints in Python or step code there. Um, but I uh, get a lot of questions if we're going to do that. So um, definitely something we're looking at. So let me jump over to a demo, and, and uh, we can take a look how this, uh, how this works. So this is only supported in the new user interface right now. So I'm going to start and uh, run TotalView. And um, uh, I'm going to add the dash new UI flag on here, uh, dash dash args, to then say I want to run my Python interpreter. And I'm just going to start executing a Python script. Simple as that, just as if you were going to run Python. Okay, so this is the new user interface that comes up in TotalView. Just a quick tour around, of course, source area in there. If I didn't start with the program um, in the beginning, we have a start page that allows you to either resume uh, recent sessions, um, start debugging a new program, um, and we also uh, list through uh, what's new in the product on there, just trying to um, make sure you, s you see all the great work that my team is doing. All your processes and threads that come in will show up in this pane over here called Process and Threads View. Any um, action points or breakpoints will show up down below. Um, and then as we start to look at data, it'll either appear uh, along with my call stack in local variables, or it can do deeper analysis in my data view, as we'll see through. We're seeing a bit of source here. I'm using, um, I'm running on a CentOS 7 system right now. I'm using the stock Python that's installed with the system, but I did install extra debug symbols there so that TotalView can see inside of that interpreter that it's going. But other than that, there's no other changes on there. Now, when Python loads an extension, um, it does it purely dynamically. So right now, TotalView has no idea what's going to happen as this, as this uh, script gets run on here. But I can go through and set some breakpoints in, um, uh, in a shared library that I know that's going to get loaded as an extension. And I have a function that's called fact for factorial. So what TotalView do is will do is create a pending breakpoint and kind of hold that aside down here. And then when any shared library or symbol gets loaded that matches, it'll set a breakpoint there. So we'll start running. Python will start executing the script on there, which will then uh, end up at some point calling into my extension and down into my C++, uh, C++ and C code on here. So here's my fact routine and my breakpoint that was set on it. So I want to kind of highlight through here is we're down at C++, but here's my integrated call stack here with Python. I can go up a level here. This is Python code right inside of uh, TotalView. Here's my import statement. That is what brought in my extension that I created. And it's uh, named TP here. And this is the point that, that my fact routine is called, uh, passed in a variable A. I can look at all my local variables. Um, we have a, a drawer here. Um, and here's all my local variables for the Python. Um, I can drag any of those down into my data view and watch those there. So let me go down if I have. Uh, in this case, I don't have any really interesting um, structured data, but I do have a complex type, and I can expand on those. Now, we put a little lock symbol here. We don't allow you to change the values of Python variables yet. Um, uh, we're looking into to, to doing that. 
And if I close that drawer out of the way, I can continue up my Python stack, and we can see where um, another um, import was done and called down. And then finally, at my top level, when my uh, Python script that I add to, to the command line there was, uh, was run. So, um, so that's, uh, you can see in a very simple Python uh, debugging session here, um, I get a great view of, um, of the two languages coming together and I can analyze the data on both sides here, make sure that everything's marshaled across, everything's coming back into there. Um, I've got uh, a number of clients uh, using this heavily. If anybody knows of Maya uh, for animation out there, uh, I've got animation clients. Uh, it's built in C++, has Python inside of it, and they're extending Maya with Python extensions, they, use, they rely on this heavily to make sure that what they're building out there is correct for animation. So reverse debugging. Uh, so reverse debugging, it's, it's an amazing feature, and I don't like to use things uh, lightly on there. It really is uh, pretty neat to see how this works when we go through in the demo in here. Um, so what you'll find is it's a great way to save time um, because what's really happening here is that TotalView, as your program is running, is going to capture that execution determinist deterministically, and it's going to literally allow you to step back through that execution. And you can look at um, variables um, and their values. You can run backwards to, say, breakpoint locations, or if you had an evaluation point that said, if this value of this variable is this value of a particular uh, value, then stop. Um, and some of the things I really like about it is I can take that state and I can save it and I can load it later so that I can replay that execution on there. I could share it with a colleague if I need help because they understand the algorithm better than me. Um, replay works with our memory debugging technology so all the, any leaks or any problems in there um, will just be right along with the whole state of the execution there. Um, it does only work on Linux x86 and x86-64, so unfortunately for like blue gene system here, um, uh, it won't work in there, but it's great if you know, you're just working on your, your Linux um, type of desktops or supercomputers that are using those architectures. Questions? Yes? So how about uh, if a program is getting a lot of signals and spend a lot of time with signal handling? Yes, it'll capture signals through and all the state of that, yep, and, and um, it'll handle that and replay those going through. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so do you enable the reverse capability before you start debugging, or is it always uh, right? That's a good question. Uh, so you can turn it on on demand, and uh, so um, I'll do it from the beginning of my program here because it's a small program, but um, on a large program, it, there is an overhead, obviously, with this. It can be, you know, anywhere. Yeah, it can be, you know, 15 to 30 percent, depending on the characteristics of your application, um, on how it's using memory and the number of every time a major state changes with your program. We need to kind of keep, tr keep track of that going through. Um, and there's a couple ways that... 15 to 30 time? Uh, yeah, typically it could be, yeah, it's time. What about space? Uh, there is an impact on that as well, but that's controllable. So it uses a circular buffer, and you can control the size of the buffer of that recorded history on there. So it will age out old history, which is typically okay, because if a problem is encountered, it's more, more than likely it's closer to where you've recorded that history anyway. Um, so for some of the other labs that we work with, um, there's two techniques that we employ. One is adjusting the size of that buffer. Um, but the first technique that I ask is, that I suggest is set, setting and turning on recording when you're getting close to something that you're interested in. Um, so you may go to a certain point, get beyond a PI init, and let it run. You know, if you get an hour of setup, let it go there, hit that breakpoint, and then activate it, and then begin recording from that point. You can't turn it off and on, though. So once it's on, it's on. Uh, when did you add this feature to TotalWheel? How do I switch it to... In no, no. When did you add this feature? Oh, when did we add it? Um, it's been seven or eight years, I think. It's been quite a while since we've had this in here. Uh, I'm asking is because uh, this is a relatively new feature in 
JDB, and it was very much discussed. And I was just wondering if you had the feature before them or. We had the feature before them, and uh, and from what I've heard, so in all in all um, disclosure here, we partner with a company that provides that underneath technology for us. Um, they also put it behind GDB uh, on their side. Um, the the company's Undo Software. If you ever want to look into them there, um, but we integrate it tightly in with TotalView uh, and provide that there. Um, I know they've done some performance characteristic uh, comparisons between the GDB one and um, and we're a lot faster. Uh, their version's a lot faster and more robust. So it's it's as you can imagine, complicated stuff. There's a bunch of PhDs that have worked on this stuff for many years. So. All right, so let me show a demo on here so that you can get a flavor of um, how this stuff works. So I'm going to do this under TotalView's Classic, uh, the, exist the older UI, just so you can see both out there. Um, so I'm going to just start TotalView on a demo that I have. I'm going to run this twice. Uh, and the first time I'm going to go through, I'm just going to run it right up without doing any replay. And the program's going to crash uh, at a segmentation violation. Now, as a, as a developer, normally I would just say, all right, so where's, where did I crash? Where's my stack? There's nothing there but a PC, so that's a pretty dismal situation. You don't know where you ended up. So what's, what's, what do you end up doing? You have to restart, you set a breakpoint, hope you don't crash you know, before that breakpoint. You start stepping, you'll crash again, and you keep that process up until you basically narrow into the point of the code. It can be very time consuming. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to kill and I'm going to simply uh, press the record button on here, which I could have done later if I want to, but I'm just going to do it from the start. And we're going to run again and end up in my exact same position here with the crash. But now I'm going to use a corollary set of commands to then start stepping backwards. So instead of step forwards, I'm going to go to previous on here. And we'll see this PC start to move back through. Now I'm down at line 58. And if I go back on here, I'm going to literally start going back through my code. And uh, you can see I'm in a loop here. It's got a variable i, and the value currently is 1 on here. And uh, we'll see that uh, just start to increment as it goes through this loop on here. So I'm not going to take, um, so what, what's going wrong on here is, um, is I'm filling a variable v that is a, an array of 20. But the, uh, I started at an index 100 and basically decremented through. So it's a classic case where you trash the stack because you overwrote memory on here. Um, so we can see what's wrong on here pretty quickly. But I'm going to use another technique in total view. And this is where the real power of debugging comes in, is understanding the capabilities of, of total view here and how to combine a couple of these techniques to solve your problem. So I'm going to use a technique called watch points where I'm going to watch this variable and then create a watch point, and I'm going to say, now start running backwards, and when this variable's value changes, stop. Okay, so I'm going to now say, go back, and it stops at line 61, where I'm assigned the value, five times max depth. Max depth just happens to be um, a pound defined of 20. So that's where the 100 came in on here. So one session with one watch point, I figured out what was wrong with my program. No real breakpoints or anything. So I can, um, I can disable this point here, and I could go back and forth uh, through my code. And this is where the exploration comes in very nice. So let's say that function A is a new function to a library I don't know anything about. I want to explore it. Maybe I stepped over it. I don't like the return value that I got. Now I can just go backwards. I can now step right into it, and I can step over. Um, into another function on here. If I had stepped over that and said, oh, wait a minute, I want to go into that, I go backwards, and I'll step into it, and I can just go back and forth in my code on this here. Fantastic way to learn your code and really understand what your algorithms are doing. Okay, uh, so let's keep going from here. Um, so of course, you know, we, we've looked at those two features here. TotalView has, has been built, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, this question. Quick question on the on the visual layout in the demo. Yep. Um, it was highlighting the line where the code happened, but this has also um, been nicely formatted code where you have each new command on a new line. Does mm -hmm. it does it make any distinction if you have a bunch of things on one line? 
Uh, it's a good question. Yes, it does, actually. If I, if, um, I could, and that, well, often when you get a four statement on there, you got three statements really in a row on that there. Um, you can actually change the view on total view um, to, let's see if I go source as both. And I can see the source and the instruction level there. So that's where you're really going to see um, as those are going through. I can instruction level reverse step down on that point there. So I can get that level of control uh, down to how my program is running. Uh, that's actually handy depending on what the compiler is doing. You're trying to understand what did the compiler actually do with my memory there, and you want to look at it. I think the comment that you missed is it's only as good as the, the information that the compiler is recorded. That's always true when it comes to a debugger. <laughs> Keep that in mind. Yeah. Okay. Good questions. Okay, um, so TotalView has been built from ground up to handle uh, many processes and threads at a time. Um, I, I normally would do a demo here, but it takes a little, I don't want to, maybe if I have time at the end, or, or definitely see me afterwards, and I can show you a little more around doing parallel. But one of the aspects I do like to show off, so um, this, this, this um, display in the right over here, um, one of the ways that TotalView makes sure to scale is we do aggregation of the information that's coming back from, uh, say, your parallel job and the threads that are running with it. And then using a series of attributes that you can control, uh, TotalView will group uh, and combine that information through. So if you've got a large job out there running 8,000 ranks and one of those either crashes or gets to a point that is at a break point that you didn't expect out there, well, how do you sift through that quickly? And um, by, by controlling the attributes in, uh, in total view, you can say, I want you to do it by uh, location, in the code, or right down to maybe an action point or breakpoint ID. And then that will separate itself out from the 8,000. You'll see the one that's at a location you don't expect. All the others are maybe sitting um, at, uh, or maybe still running out there. Um, this performs very quickly on there. And um, it's, a, it's a great way to understand what your job is doing. TotalView uh, has got a lot of other capabilities, uh, just supporting C++ out there. If you're using lambdas, um, uh, we transform automatically smart pointers. So if you get an auto type there, TotalView just look at it as a pointer. It'll show you it there. It's not going to show you as structure of how it's actually implemented. Uh, any of those other types there. We do the same for um, maps and vectors and other STL types there. So uh, on the left, if you were to look at a normal map, it's written as a red-black tree. But TotalView will transform that into an array of key-value pairs, which is, as a developer, as we're thinking about it on there. And we do that for many types, uh, tuples, vectors, and others, like I mentioned. Arrays uh, are, are an important feature of any program, and being able to control them to get down to the data you want is important. So uh, TotalView has a number of ways that you can slice the array into something smaller. You can stride it to say, I want only every fifth element on there. You can also filter it uh, to say, in this case here, I want any value greater than 0.2 and less than 0.5. Uh, this is a great way if you have a large array and you want to find a NAN in there, uh, is you can use a dollar NAN in that filter, um, and it will quickly go through that whole array and just show you any NANs or anything like that might be in there. We can do a level of statistics on the array that you end up with even after filtering it on there, and this is handy sometimes, just uh, and also another way to look for a NAN count in your array. Uh, we have a 2D and 3D visualizer in there, so once you have an array that you want uh, to kind of look at, you can then uh, visualize those and interact with those. Some other very handy features, uh, a dive and all. So if you're looking at an array of structures, you can very easily um, focus on one element of that. So in this case here, I'm cl clicked on Zebo. What I actually do is, um, is I right-clicked on X, and I say, show me all the values of x throughout that whole structure of arrays. So it picked all those out and built me an array. And now I could visualize that array if I wanted to. So it's a great way to, to kind of get into your data. And uh, similarly, as far as looking across things, you can do the same with uh, processes of threads. So uh, in this case here, we're looking at a, a variable named source across uh, my entire job here. And it shows me each of those there. And I can do that in a thread for threads as well. Um, so if you use an OpenMP, uh, you may look at all the values in the particular threads for, um, for your process that's running. 
Okay, so like I said earlier, memory debugging is built into TotalView uh, from, uh, from right into the whole uh, debugging session on there. Um, it's a great way to find, of course, leaks in your code. Um, it'll also help you detect uh, dangling pointers, um, any buffer runs, overruns. And it's got a number of other facilities in there to help you deal with memory to find maybe um, where you access memory um, before it was initialized or maybe after it was a free after it was freed. So if you've allocated a block of memory, we can paint that memory with a pattern. Um, and then if you tried to access it, you're going to recognize that pattern there. So you'll know right away that I'm accessing memory that's uninitialized. Um, Often, and more importantly, when you deinitialize, you get a dangling pointer out there. You may still be accessing that memory, so we can stripe that memory again and force an error in your program sooner, um, because that memory just may not have been reallocated by the system allocator, um, and will still hold the values of your program for a while, and uh, that can make, make for intermittent problems. It also has uh, great facilities for collaboration. You can save all the um, state of that memory out to uh, either an HTML report if you want to post it, or a raw memory debugging file. It's kind of like a core file for memory, and you can reload that, perform the analysis again. Um, but what I like to do with it is compare it. So what I'll do with um, a program is I'll baseline it to see our map for leaks. And then I'll go fix some leaks on there, and I'll compare that to my baseline, make sure that I'm actually fixing things and they're going away. Now, just a quick note on the technology that we use here. We use um, interposition or proxy. Um, so it's a little different than maybe Purify or even Valgrind out there. In those cases, they're purifying instruments code. Valgrind runs kind of a simulated CPU on there. Now, the advantage they have is they know every read and write that's going on in memory. So if you overwrite a bottom memory, it can tell you the instant that happens. If you access memory that's not initialized, it'll tell you right away. But there comes a cost with that with overhead. In ours, um, we get in between the system, uh, system um, calls for, say, malloc and free. And um, when a call goes down to allocate memory, we um, see what the operating system returned. If it's an error, we raise it right away. If it's um, otherwise, we just build up a set of tables of the layout of memory. And, um, and using that, we can then detect illegal use of memory. But we can also pad that memory with some uh, regions on there and stripe that to detect if you did overwrite the bounds of that memory on there. Um, so even though we don't have, uh, we don't utilize some of the technologies for instant notification, you will know that you overwrote memory. And if you combine that again with watch points, so our memory technology would say, hey, you overwrote this bound over here. You can then watch that memory using watch points again with replay and run backwards to find the instant you overwrote that memory. So again, combining several techniques to solve the problem in your code. And uh, memory is built to support HPC, just like TotalView. So uh, in this case here, I have a number of ranks that are run. And I can look at the memory across all of them. I may say you know, all the ranks should be about the same, but maybe I have an outlier in there. And that will quickly show up uh, and allow me to do deeper investigation of the memory usage of that rank. OK, so um, unattended debugging on here is a way of running TotalView in a headless mode. Basically, you're going to submit your job. You're going to run it underneath TotalView, but there's no interaction with it. So you don't need to set up an interactive queue or, or anything like that. Um, but um, it basically allows you to um, create some events and then actions based on that as your program runs. So um, let me flip to the next slide here, and you can kind of get an idea of some things you can do with it. So the name of the script is called tvscript, and um, you give it directives. I can do it through command line, or I can feed it a file. So in this case, um, on this line up here, I'm saying, create me an action point on method one. And if it's ever hit, display the backtrace and show me the, all the arguments of my functions there. And then I'm going to create a second action point on, method, uh, on file method.c at line 342. And I want to print the value of variable x. And then I give it the information for my program on there. So as this runs, any of those, when those action points are hit on there, we're either going to display a backtrace with all the variables uh, or print out the value of x. And that all gets coded to a log file that you can then pick up after your session is run through, uh, through, your, uh, through your job. Memory debugging is fully supported here, so I can run um, on, we build on top of this with memscript. And I can go through and check guard blocks, generate leaks, generate reports, all um, 
in a, in a way like this. So this is great if you don't know when your job's going to run or it takes a while to run, and you just look at the results afterwards. How many people doing CUDA around here? Are you doing? You got a few? OK. All right. So TotalView fully supports CUDA. We're up to the latest SDKs um, and uh, their Volta cards that are out. Um, we also have supported Xeon 5 from, since the beginning, uh, and Knight's Landing and all the iterations through there. Um, if you're doing anything with OpenACC, we support OpenACC as well. We don't formally support OpenCL. If you're doing stuff there, TotalView kind of works on it. Um, again, it does depend on how well the, uh, the compilers put debug information there uh, so that we can use it. Um, so I won't go through in detail on here, but it pretty much looks like a normal session. Um, TotalView just picks up that your program is, is using CUDA, and, uh, but we do have ways in there for navigating across your device and so forth. Uh, we do have a release coming out at the end of this month, and one of the major changes we have for that is an improvement in the workflow for, um, for debugging CUDA. So typically, when you start a CUDA application, it's running on the host, you know, the CPU, and then your code will get launched off to the kernel running on the GPU. Uh, in the past, uh, you will, couldn't set breakpoints on that kernel code until it launched. And so we've uh, improved the workflow for TotalView so that you can just set breakpoints all from the beginning. And when it gets loaded to the, the GPU, TotalView will uh, automatically set the breakpoints there. So it's a nice improvement for developers. And just some information on Xeon 5 as well. We do have a capability called the Remote Display Client. Um, and this is great for uh, cases where you do need to remote into, say, a cluster. Uh, and work on that there. Uh, I'm just going to flip to the last screen here so you can kind of see it. Um, really what this does is it, it, it uh, smooths out the workflow of maybe even one or multiple hops to log into your cluster. So in this case here, um, I've got an example of where we go into Vesta. Um, so you put my information up there, my user information on that, and then any information about where TotalView is going to run, how you're going to run your job, it'll automatically build in the SSH hops that you need to do uh, from, say, on my Mac here, if I wanted to do that and I wanted to connect to Vesta. Um, of course, I got to enter my password as the windows come up through. And it will build, um, it uses VNC technology underneath a server and a viewer automatically, so it'll establish everything for you and tunnel those displays through, uh, through your session on there. So um, all of this gets saved off, so the next time around, I just need to double click on Vesta and, and log in, and everything will be built up again. So it's a, it's a handy way to um, do cluster type of development. Okay, so um, to use TotalView within a, in a parallel environment, there's really two ways to kind of launch. Um, one is through the command line. So in the bolded area there, um, you simply just say um, TotalView and then uh, dash dash args with your MPI exec or MPI run or however you're starting your job. In this case here, number process 512. And then my normal information for my MPI application. Uh, then TotalView will automatically link in right into the MPI system, acquire all the information it needs. Uh, depending on some settings of TotalView, uh, you can choose to debug some subset of your job or all of it. Um, and uh, it'll also allow you to stop everything to set breakpoints before your job starts running. You can also just start TotalView and create a, pro a parallel program session and enter all this information in here. So in this case here, you may be doing a, a blue gene system. Uh, TotalView will, will know about the different configurations there. Um, there is a scale performance difference between the two methods. Method one piggybacks on the scaling capabilities of the MPI you're using, uh, and TotalView leverages that and depends on it. In this case, it's a, a little more robust method for uh, maybe a, a system that TotalView doesn't know about there, it'll launch in through, but it doesn't scale co to quite as high. This is good for maybe up to a couple thousand, um, but if you're going higher than that, you're going to want to just launch from the command line and let TotalView uh, piggyback along with the MPI system. Now here at Argon, um, so TotalView is installed in this path up there. Um, you can also do a module load TotalView, and it'll set up the path for you, um, and you can begin running it there. Um, we have some information about memory debugging here, and actually it's something I, I should have pointed out earlier. 
Um, there's no pre-compilation or anything needed to use our memory debugging. You literally just click a button, and we use the dynamic loading capabilities to slip in between the memory calls. Except if you're on uh, a static executable like on BlueGeneQ, and in those cases there, you do need to link in uh, the agent so that TotalView can then get the information that it needs. And just some examples there. And um, just doing some of the job control here. So um, if you're doing a small amount, um, I wouldn't advise really too much. You can do the login nodes. But if you are going to run through the cluster, follow the instructions for doing interactive debugging. Um, and they have instructions out on the website of how to set that up. And then once you have your allocation, you can then run your MPI job into that using that total view command. So it will then acquire the debugging session. Then you can do interactive debugging. There's um, a lot of resources out on our website, so this is kind of informational here when you look through the slide deck. Um, take a look through the doc there. There's some blogs and videos and other stuff um, that go through the Python debugging and other areas as well. And okay, um, that's what I had to go over. Any, any questions that I can answer for folks? Yes? Because my group we use Valgrind for memory, so what kind of capabilities does the computer for As compared to Valgrind, yeah. Memory, because otherwise we use total view for other people. Right, right, yeah. Um, so total view can find, obviously, leaks. That's the biggest thing out there. Um, it, will, um, it will detect a buffer overrun. And like I said earlier, Valgrind will tell you the instant you do it. We will tell you that you have overwritten a buffer. Um, and then you can use reverse debugging and watch points to then find the point you did it. We can't tell you if you read beyond a buffer side. That's an area that Valgrind would have an advantage because we're not watching every memory read that happens out there. Um, if you did a double free um, or other uh, illegal uses of memory uh, APIs, we'll all pick up on that and tell you that information. Um, the memory te technology that we have, you can either run it standalone, so you're just doing memory debugging. I typically run it with total view, so I can step my code and set breakpoints. And once the debugger is involved, I, at any point in my program, I can look for leaks. And I can also um, set a breakpoint, say, before a library call. And I can baseline memory to say, just tag all memory and what you know about it, do a step over that, that call, and then compare the difference of that. And this is great if you're looking at a library to say, all right, this library just leaked 50 megabytes of memory on me. Now, because I had reverse debugging turned on too, I can go backwards, and then I can determine where, me where memory was actually leaked and look at it. So mixing interactive in with your memory debugging session, which Valgrind can't do, um, then you have a very, uh, very strong capability to find out how your program's using memory and where it's got errors. Does that help? Do you perhaps have the read option? I'm sorry, say that again. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, is uh, reverse debugging support in uh, multi thread and multi processing program? And uh, can I, if so, can I like, uh, freeze some of the threads or processes and then merge other threads and processes? It's a good question. So, um, uh, so, so, Yes, uh, we fully support multi-threaded applications and uh, multi-process. Re the reverse debugging is enabled on a per-process basis. So if you um, have eight ranks going out there, you may not need to record all eight, um, but you could selectively, you could if you wanted to, but you could selectively choose the ones that you want. Um, as you are debugging it on there, it's, it's full up running through. The threads are doing what they need to do on there. Um, if you want to stop uh, with a breakpoint, TotalView allows uh, to either stop the whole group, all the processes running, or one process, or even down to one thread. You can say, if this thread ID is this, only stop this thread, let everything else keep running out there. Of course, if you have dependencies on that one that's now halted, then you could have some issues. But um, you have that full level of control. So I have one comment and one question. Sure. Um, as uh, Bill mentioned, the reverse debugging is supported on x86. So the corollary of that is that if you're trying it on the blue jeans, the blue jeans are not x86, so that won't work. So just just keep that in mind. So the, uh, my question, though, is 
sooner or later, when you get to a large rank count, you're going to have some kind of scalability problems. Mm -hmm. So what method or methods, or what, what features would you suggest using to cope with the whatever issues you mm -hmm. use? Uh, so I would, I would not encourage enabling replay on all of them all at once because there's a high overhead with that. It's not restricted to the reverse. Right, right, yeah, or in memory. So, if, um, so there's a couple ways that I would approach on that there. If, if you can detect down to maybe a, a handful of ranks or certain situations where there might be a problem, um, I would try to narrow the problem down and choose a subset of what I want to debug. So with all of you, you can um, choose uh, particular jobs that are going out and, and debug there. Um, and if, um, if there's problems with it, so once you've got your subset on there, you can um, uh, either plant breakpoints around of where you need to investigate through. Um, you can control. Uh, depending on the state of, like I might use an evaluation point that is looking at the state of my application and if something isn't quite right on there, um, I may control it so the whole group stops at that point because um, I want to investigate everything that might have been, might have received a message from another rank that was going that led it off the rails. Um, and then from there I can look at and easily go between the different um, processes um, that are under my debugger's control um, and try to just understand the state of what's going on there. Um, if I could repeat it in a way that um, I could see a couple ranks with issues, I would then invoke replay engine on those so that I could go backwards and forwards through the history of those uh, at that point and continue to narrow down to the problem. Once I can get replay involved on there, it'll allow me to hopefully understand or solve the problem much faster. So when you look at a value, uh, let's say a variable value, uh, are there some really scaling issues where there are too many rank, you know, you're looking at the value on every rank, but the window's not big enough or anything like that? You will have um, with the, um, with either display on there, if you did a view across of that, of that value, um, uh, you could end up with a lot of rows uh, of each of the threads or processes showing that. Um, we have done that out to pretty high scales. I don't know what the upper limit is on that. It, does, it will depend on some of the resources of the head node of where you're running total view. Um, but even if you could end up saying display 20 or 30,000 as a developer, that's a lot to consume. But um, if you do end up with a lot there, you can use the filter capabilities of the data view to then begin to narrow that data down to look for some anomalies. I'm thinking more like a million. <laughs> that would probably, yeah, that probably would begin to stress where we're at. Um, we, we do have, we haven't pushed them up through the UI yet. We have data aggregation capabilities in the product. Um, that we've been doing for some of the other labs. And um, one of the, um, we'll be adding that into our new user interface um, as, we, um, as we keep pushing that along to support full HPC. Um, so it's something that we're thinking about there and we've had some success with. Um, but it's good to hear the scales you're at so we can think along those, those numbers. Well, I, I, yeah. So you mentioned uh, with the, um, uh, the TV script, uh, about getting uh, backtraces. <laughs> so, will you get a backtrace from every rank? Uh, let's see, if you... Or can you narrow that down? Because that, that could be a potential... You can do... You can do an aggregated backtrace across all of them or all the ones within your debugging session. Um, the ones that I showed here would be on a per process basis, but you can do it where you would change what we call our focus to be the entire group. Um, and in that case there, you can do an aggregated uh, backtrace. So it'll kind of build a tree and show you where you're branching off from that tree, uh, which is we have a call stack view that does something similar through the graphical interface as well. And just to follow up on your point about the reverse debugging, if you're running on the Xeon Phi systems here, if you run out on the Phi where it's got the AVX 512, um, the reverse debugging is not supported there yet as well. So we've been um, working with uh, the company that we partner with to see if they can then push into that space as well. So it's, it really is just that x86 and x86-64 processor. Okay. Yes? 
question. So sure. you mentioned we can debug uh, Python code with, with Puzzle View. So uh, we know that in Python, we typically have pre-compiled uh, dependencies like, like NumPy, SciPy, all these stuff are pre-compiled either by Conda or by PyPy. So um, does, do we have to recompile these external packages? No, um, and it's a good question, and thank you for bringing about the NumPy as well, because we actually support um, uh, native NumPy arrays, so if I, and, and I just didn't have enough time in this demo, but I could have brought up a NumPy array, looked at it in the Python, looked at how it got translated down into C++ on there. So the question is, um, there's a lot of, like, you get Anaconda and, and many of the others that distribute Python with it on there. Now, it, it, what we're finding is it depends on how they have packaged Python. So what we found with Anaconda 4, you could install the debug information that any debugger, whether it's GDB or TotalView, they both need it uh, to get that view inside of the Python interpreter. Um, they did that with 4. In the early versions of 5, they didn't. And it basically broke it for TotalView on there. So I need to go back now that they've had a couple of releases, and I'm hoping they're adding it back in so that we get that support. Um, we have to look at some of the others out there as well. Now, another question just for folks who are looking at Python that I've gotten from some, um, some other HPC centers is, well, do we support MPI Python? And, um, and I've run some initial tests on that, and it worked. I launched MPI Python. TotalView acquired the whole session out there. Uh, MPI, all of my instances of Python that ran in the cluster, that loaded that extension for me. TotalView stopped in them, and I got the nice, clean stack trace on there. And I could see all the Pythons within my debugging session uh, that were all using MPI. Uh, they did a nice job with MPI Python implementing that so it follows the standards and really it's C underneath there and just TotalView understands it. So I was really impressed uh, that it just worked. <laughs>